Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to take a little trip down memory lane and revisit President Richard Nixon's diplomacy and detente with the former Soviet Union. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Jinks. Dr. Jinks is a professor of history with a specialty in Russian history. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for coming back, because speaking of visits, I believe this is your third visit here. We're glad to have you back. Oh, thank you very much. Third time's always a charm. Very good. Well, let's go ahead and get started on revisiting Richard Nixon's history mm -hmm. uh, with diplomacy and detente and the Soviet Union. You've done a lot of research, being a Russian historian, you've done a lot of research on relations between the Soviet Union and the West, particularly with the U.S. You've been to both the Nixon Library and the Reagan Library to do this research. As you were researching at the Nixon Library, you came across a lot of documents which uh, actually um, started to give you a very positive impression of the way uh, President Nixon was handling the Cold War in the early 70s. Uh, what were those items that gave you uh, that positive impression that you saw in regard to uh, President Nixon? Yeah, well, I think that the, the most important uh, insight into Nixon came from his correspondence with Brezhnev, that he had conducted an, almost a kind of bromance, I suppose we would say in our terminology today. And that suggested to me how flexible Nixon was in trying to change the dynamic in uh, Soviet-American relations. He was, after all, the original red baiter, uh, and uh, he was responsible in large part for inspiring McCarthyism. But I think that what happens when Nixon becomes president is that he recognizes that the world has changed and he needs to change along with it. That his hyper ideological approach to combating communism uh, needs to be tempered and perhaps even uh, radically changed in order to adapt to a changing world. And so for me, real leadership is about adaptation, being able to change, to recognize that the world has changed if you're the leader of the United States, and to change along the, with that world, but in a way that would benefit the United States. And this is a kind of a red thread that runs through so many of the documents that I encountered in the, um, at least the foreign um, policy part of the Nixon archives in Yorba Linda. And I know that we had a previous conversation about this in which you indicated that uh, uh, President Nixon was also a realist and yeah. a pragmatist, and he had a realization that the United States had limits. We couldn't fight endless wars against uh, communist foes all around the world, and so that recognition of limits, I think, was also part of his uh, pragmatism, and as a result, he also opened the door to China when Mao Zedong was still in charge. Uh, we had the ping-pong diplomacy where we started with ping-pong teams and then that ended up being a much more uh, formal opening of the China door. So as a strategic thinker as well as a realist, what was Nixon up to when he was both opening the door to China and um, starting detente with Russia? What was going on there? Well, I think that, that Nixon, first of all, recognized that uh, China was um, having a conflict with the Soviet Union. And so this idea of a monolithic communist world uh, had begun to uh, collapse, at least in Nixon's eyes. And so he felt that he could play the Soviet Union and China off against each other. And it was a kind of a policy of triangulation. Uh, and seeing that relationship between the United States and China and the United States and Soviet Union is something that he could exploit in order to advance the interest of the United States. Um, now that connects also, I think, with the question of limits, because there was a sense that um, our ability to fight communism on a global scale here, the Vietnam War was a dramatic illustration of that, was limited. We had limited budgets. The price of energy was to go up dramatically. Uh, and um, so there were limits to what Nixon could do, and that required that he had to reach out to former enemies, or at least to ideological enemies, in order to develop a new kind of relationship. One that would have political benefits in the sense of transcending the uh, danger of nuclear holocaust across the globe, but also one that would have practical economic benefits. That is to say that he could develop trade with both China and the Soviet Union enhance American business interests at a time when American business interests were being challenged by European and other competitors. And so it was incredibly important for Nixon to figure out ways to deal with limits, both politically and ideologically, but also economically. Uh, and again, that 
that points back toward, I think, my, my idea that I expressed before, what a creative kind of political creature he was, at least when it came to foreign policy. And if we talk about détente, of course, détente is a French word. And uh, there was a practical application there that also involved economics uh, that uh, Nixon and Kissinger were looking at. So how did détente get started with the French? So one of the things that I was most struck by in the National Security Council files that, um, that carry Henry Kissinger's name uh, are extensive reports uh, about the relationship between the French and the Soviet Union. And they go back to the uh, French uh, 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 widespread collaboration between the French and the Soviets as a result of an agreement in 1966. Uh, and in that agreement, the French agreed to uh, engage in trade with the Soviet Union, to exchange information about nuclear power, civilian nuclear power, and also to collaborate broadly in space, both manned space exploration and also unmanned space exploration. Uh, and so the, the United States National Security Council was paying very close attention to this original policy of detente, which is, after all, a French word. And so Nixon's policy of detente was actually an emulation, an imitation of the French example. And that becomes quite clear when you look at the National Security Council archives. And another aspect of the detente, you've mentioned the so-called bromance between yeah. uh, Richard Nixon and uh, Brezhnev. I'm sure they wouldn't have referred to it in those days under, uh, with those terms. But, uh, and also the detente was the fact that uh, Nixon was seeing, or, or as you've mentioned, he, he was imagining peace as a strategy to avoid war. So he had a vision of peace, which was interesting because um, his public perception was that he was a war hawk, mm -hmm. which was, I guess, necessary at that time because of the politics uh, that were uh, underway in the United States. Um, so he had to maintain this image of being tough, tough on the communists or tough in defense of national security and so on, because his opponent in the 72 election was George McGovern, the Democrat who was seen as a peace dove. He was mm -hmm. seen as, mm -hmm. as uh, not strong enough too weak when it came to foreign policy, and so Nixon won handily in the 72 election, largely based on that, but some other practical considerations as well, uh, because of things that Nixon had done with the EPA and Clean Water Act, uh, uh, war on cancer, and things like that. So looking at that, how was Nixon able to juggle this need to have the tough exterior and the tough image as being, you know, uh, protector of the United States interests? and yet at the same time having this sort of private vision of peace or how we can make things better. Well, I think here his anti-communist legacy helped. So he could always say, hey, look, if anyone knows how to be tough with the commies, I'm that person, right? I've done it, I've been there. But the world's changed and we need to recognize that there are openings that we can take advantage of. So I think his, his uh, historical legacy as one of the original red baiters, one of the inspirations for McCarthyism helps him in this regard become more dove-like. And by the way, this is also the problem with Democrats, right? Is that they're gonna be accused always of being a too dovish and giving away the store because, and they can't point to the fact that they have this legacy of being tough on communism. And so they bend over backwards to try to be at times tough on the communism. Uh, whereas the Republicans can say, hey, look, you don't have to worry. We're always going to be looking out for America's interest, protecting it from communism. I've been there, done that, but the situation has changed. Uh, and here again, we see the creativity of Nixon as a leader, especially in regard to foreign policy. Well, interestingly, one of the areas which Nixon pursued uh, in detente was the space race. Yes. And we always thought of the space race as a technology race against the Soviets, and that we had to win that space race to prove our superiority, the superiority of our system, and so on. And John Kennedy kicked that off in the early 60s. And Nixon was I, he actually, yeah, he was president when we first walked on the moon in 1969. He had just become president. That's right. And was inaugurated the previous January. So he was able to uh, preside over that. And so, but Nixon saw the space race not as much about competition so much as an opportunity for detente and cooperation with the Soviets in outer space. Um, why did he see outer space as that opportunity? Well, here we get to the, I think, the critical importance of a, an iconic image called Earthrise, December 25th, 1968. So Nixon has been elected president, but not yet inaugurated. And we have this dramatic image of seeing the Earth rise up 
over the horizon of the moon from Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve. Uh, Frank Borman was very much a part of that, and he also became a sort of unofficial diplomat for the Nixon administration. So Nixon, in his inaugural speech, makes direct reference to space exploration and Earthrise as an illustration of how we occupy this kind of fragile planet together, that we need to transcend our hostilities uh, and the, uh, the potential for mutual assured destruction, nuclear apocalypse, and that um, the vision of the Earth from space with that vision, you don't see the lines that separate nations, the political lines and boundaries. You just see one humanity. So he, he um, takes advantage of that image of a kind of, uh, of, a, of a fragile globe and of a unified sort of uh, human community in order to uh, launch his uh, first administration. And so right from the get-go, he's presenting himself as a peacemaker. And I think it's a, it's, this is intended to be done. This is very deliberate. He's trying to set the tone. And this, of course, will fit in with his attempt to try to get out of Vietnam, but also with his increasing emphasis not on a space race, but on collaborating with our former ideological enemy, the Soviets. So space for Nixon is his way into changing the dynamic in foreign relations. And again, this is something I see very clearly from the documents in the Nixon archive, and also, by the way, from the Soviet side as well. And the Soviets were incredibly receptive to this, uh, to the great surprise of many in NASA, who were very hawkish, and certainly in the Pentagon, who were very hawkish. Uh, the Soviets were receptive to the idea of collaboration, genuine collaboration, and Nixon constantly had to push against um, uh, those within the Pentagon and NASA and elsewhere in his administration that did not trust the Soviets and said there's no way that we can collaborate them. And yet it was Nixon who constantly used his authority from the top to push this uh, and ultimately was quite successful. Uh, it created the first major collaborative effort, uh, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. It was initiated in 1970. Uh, it was finally came to culmination after Nixon had been kicked out of office as a result of Watergate in 1975, but that was Nixon's baby. Uh, and actually that, that initiated the era of space collaboration that continues all the way on up to the present in the form of the International Space Station. But this is in large part, in some senses, the International Space Station is Nixon's baby. We have just a few seconds before we go to the break. I wanted to ask you about the reaction of uh, people in the Soviet Union to the moon landing. How did they receive the moon landing? Did they see it as having been beaten in the space race or were they very receptive to celebrating uh, man walking on the moon? Here, there, there are the number of surprises, particularly for Frank Borman. So uh, Nixon gets into office, and the first thing he does is he sends Borman on a tour of Europe, but also the first American astronaut to visit super secret sites in the Soviet Union to Star City, uh, and to meet with cosmonauts and uh, space administrators in the Soviet Union. And one of the things that surprises Borman most in his letters and reports back to Kissinger and back to Nixon is how the Soviets have um, responded to the American successes in its lunar manned um, programs. Uh, and the Soviets would constantly tell him, he heard this over and over again, congratulating Borman on our success. That in other words, that the conquest of the moon was a common human achievement. And of course, this worked in perfectly, it, uh, uh, it dovetailed perfectly with Nixon's rhetoric in his inaugural speech about space exploration and the view of the Earth from space as a common human achievement. Uh, and that was, I think, very striking for Nixon and for Kissinger as well. It suggested to him how open the Soviets were to shifting from an era of space competition as a sort of a space race between two competing ideologies and nations to space exploration as a collaborative venture. And that this could have very positive political and economic effects. And on that note, we'll have to go to the break. Stay with us. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about what the limits were to cooperation in space with the Soviet Union. And we'll also talk about the strategic arms limitation talks. Stay tuned. Do you love to travel? Understanding the world and all of its diverse cultures? Ever thought about becoming a foreign service officer? Living in another country and helping to promote a positive image of America? Or going undercover and working for the CIA? Or as a lobbyist, representing different interest groups to members of Congress? 
you can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Dr. Andrew Jenks, and we're talking about Nixon, the Soviet Union, and detente. And um, Andrew, before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, using space exploration as a source of cooperation uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the, during the Nixon presidency, and overtures were made. Uh, the overtures were well received by the Soviets. Um, as you mentioned, uh, in the Soviet Union, folks were pretty receptive to the moon landing uh, with Neil Armstrong, and even though it had an American flag, um, uh -huh. it, was, it was still about the human race reaching the moon, ultimately, and we're all in this together. And that was sort of where we started at that point with the cooperation, and we have cooperation today with the Soviets in space, uh, with sharing rides up to, this, to the space station and so forth. Uh, but there were limits to the cooperation uh, and using space as a form of detente. What were some of those limits, and did it involve some of the insularity here uh, in the United States and some of the political reflexes that we had at the time? Yes, uh, the limits were almost exclusively coming from the U.S. Uh, side. In other words, U.S. opposition was what um, limited the ability to collaborate in space and to extend that collaboration into other areas. Uh, from the Soviet perspective, and I investigate these issues from the Soviet archival perspective as well, um, well, they have an authoritarian top-down system. And one of the benefits of a system like that is if the leader says, okay, we're going to collaborate, then everyone collaborates. Uh, in the United States, if the leader says, we're going to collaborate, uh, there are a lot of people and all sorts of agencies throughout the government that say, eh. they say yes, but then they don't. Right? Or, and they put up other resistances. And of course, we have a multi-party system. And so if Nixon was going to take the position of detente, his political opponents in the Democratic Party were going to take the position opposed to detente. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And so as the space collaboration effort with the Soviets continued through the early 1970s, culminating with the Apollo-Soyuz test project and docking in July of 1975, uh, opposition in the Democratic Party grew dramatically to collaboration with the Soviets. There were all sorts of hysterical op-eds printed in uh, various newspapers across the United States written by Democrats and other pundits saying that we're giving away the store, that we're naive, we can't possibly treat the Soviets as equals, that we are superior. There was, in other words, an attempt to re-inject ideology back into politics and to, as a way to counter the Republicans and Nixon and also to counter the policy of detente. And sadly, I must admit, it was quite successful. And as we look at this, we, we, we mentioned earlier that there was a strong bond that formed between Leonid Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and President Nixon. Why did they develop such a strong bond? What, what, what was it that uh, allowed them to develop that bond? I think that, uh, first of all, Ambassador Dobrynin, who was uh, a long-standing ambassador who had close connections with uh, Henry Kissinger, understood the American scene quite well. Uh, he was communicating with Kissinger about the importance to Brezhnev of the personal touch, having a personal relationship. And I think Nixon was able to, um, to pick up on that and develop a very personal relationship with Brezhnev that involved the exchange of handwritten letters. Uh, in which both sides talk about their desire for peace. And also in meetings, summits between the two, in one case in San Clemente, where Brezhnev is given a car, I believe a Lincoln Continental. Uh, Brezhnev was a great fan of cars. He had a huge collection. His favorite car was, in fact, the Dodge Charger. Now, if you want an enemy of the United States, you'd want one whose dream is to have a Dodge Charger. Uh, and this is, and I think Nixon understood that he's a kind of, uh, you know, a guy, right? The guy you could hang out with, have a drink with, talk uh, guy things with, right? And cars and this kind of thing. And so that personal relationship uh, was cultivated by Nixon, also by Brezhnev, because Brezhnev uh, was a charming and charismatic person. Uh, he really was. Before he got ill later in the 1970s, he was still a very active and effective politician. 
Uh, and so that personal relationship, never underestimate the role of a personal relationship in changing the dynamic of, uh, of superpower relations or relations between powers. It has its limits, but it also has its opportunities. And I know that Richard Moss, has writ he's a historian who's written a book about the back-channel communication that, yes. that existed, and you've re re referenced that with the letters and so forth. And the back channel was great because it allowed uh, both sides to vent steam and uh, you know, reduce tensions that were developing and, and it could be secret so that it wasn't leaked and, and no one knew about it, but the leaders knew about it and that's what counted. Uh, but unfortunately, as, as is pointed out in the book, uh, this isn't the best way to do foreign policy because once that relationship is severed because of elections or term limits on the US side at least, um, the next administration may not carry on with that. Um, and so uh, having a strong bond with the foreign leader like that is important, and it's often necessary to get things done, but it doesn't last. So you have to have the more uh, structural kind of arrangement to, to carry on. And so we didn't see this carry on in the next uh, you know, uh, administrations to follow, which was unfortunate at the time. But uh, as we move forward from that, there were some other things that, that happened between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. One was the, the wheat deal. There was a big sale of grain, which was referred to as the wheat deal, where uh, President Nixon authorized this sale of wheat to the Soviet Union because they'd had crop failures for a couple of years in a row in the early yes. 70s. Made a lot of money for the farmers in the Midwest and the Plains states. They were quite happy with it. The commodities brokers were very happy with it. But a lot of people weren't happy with it and referred to it as the great grain robbery. <laughs> so why were a lot of people, politicians, uh, folks in the media, even in the general public, um, unhappy about this? They, they seemed to think that we were giving aid and comfort to uh, the Soviet Union at the expense of the American consumer. Tell us about that. Yeah, that, well, that was a, a curious um, episode, and uh, the Soviet uh, system of collective farming was a disaster, and it proved why it was a disaster with the crop failures consecutively in 1971 and 1972. And Nixon decided, okay, I'm going to kill multiple birds with one stone here. I'm going to spend $300 million and give it to the American farmer, and they're going to love me for that. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to help cement my relations with the Soviet Union by giving them credit so that they can buy $300 million worth of our grain on the taxpayer, American taxpayer tab. And the Soviets almost immediately used up that entire line of 300 million, can you imagine a line of $300 million <laughs> in credit offered to your ideological non-capitalist enemy? Uh, I mean, it, uh, it, it's astounding. At any rate, this, this is what happened. And the backlash was immediate and intense, but it also was connected to the more general uh, political opposition to Nixon. And so it, we always have to be careful to distinguish between was it a good policy, did it make sense in the long run, versus the way that Nixon's political opponents spun it in order to try to embarrass him and to try to score political points. And I think there was some logic to it that made sense to me uh, in that he was able to help American farmers, which is always nice in American politics. Uh, and at the same time, he was able to create goodwill that helped, uh, helped him to develop his uh, policy of detente and his relationship with Brezhnev. All these moving pieces fit together for Nixon. Uh, but I think the great grain robbery, as it was known, uh, was an instance where perhaps Nixon had uh, underestimated the domestic sphere. Uh, and that was always, I think, a weak point with Nixon, that uh, he was really good at foreign policy, but sometimes he screwed up when it came to domestic policy. Sometimes he screwed up big time, as, as of course we know, with regard to the Watergate controversy. And there's one final topic I want to talk about before we run out of time today, and that is the strategic arms limitation talks and also the ABM treaty. Now, the strategic arms limitation talks were the first time that the U.S. and the Soviet Union, both sides, really got serious about reducing nuclear arms since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which scared everyone because of a mutually assured destruction. So when we had the SALT talks in 1972, uh, what we actually ended up with as the initial accomplishment was the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Now, the ABM Treaty was something that was designed to prevent one side's ballistic missiles 
from attacking the other side's nuclear arsenal. So logically, you would think you would start with missile reduction, actual nuclear missile reduction, but we went to ABM anti-ballistic missile reduction first. Why was that? Well, this is, uh, gets to the uh, heart of the doctrine of mutual assured destruction. So the idea is that um, we have to have enough missiles left over. If they attack us, we have enough left over in places that they can't hit uh, to attack them uh, and to destroy them. And so the, the guarantee of mutual assured destruction is essential for paradoxically keeping the peace. Uh, you won't be tempted to attack if you know you're going to be com committing suicide as a result. The anti-ballistic missile system is designed to shoot down the missiles of the other side uh, before uh, they land. Uh, and so if you can do that effectively, then you might be tempted to think that you could attack the other side and the delicate, terrifying balance of mutual assured destruction would be destroyed. So you have to begin uh, your arms reductions with um, making sure that you don't develop anti-ballistic missile systems. And from that point, you can then begin to negotiate an actual reduction in the number of strategic nuclear weapons. So it all comes down to first strike capability and the ability right. to survive the first strike. And, um, exactly. And as you said, paradoxically, mutually assured destruction is uh, the theory that don't even try because we'll have enough left over to get you in return. It's a gigantic game of chicken. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we have pretty much run out of time, but I want to give you one last comment about Richard Nixon's greatest achievement. What do you think it was? I think uh, clearly his greatest achievement is in foreign policy and in being flexible enough to recognize that the world had changed and that there were limits on U.S. power. So he had to come up with more creative ways of dealing with uh, his ideological enemies, uh, in part by emphasizing realism and de-emphasizing the role of ideology in American foreign policy. And on that note, we'll have to bring the program to a close. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.